After a solid run through the non-conference season, a rested and recharged South Dakota squad was eager to make a statement as they opened up league play. How's everybody doing? I'm Jay Elson, and this is Coyote Corner. Well, USD's wins over UC Davis and Drake were nice, but Joe Glenn knew his team wouldn't really find out where it stood until it came face-to-face -face with the Valley. And they'd get a stiff test right out of the gate as they played host to Bo Pelini and 10th-ranked Youngstown State in the 99th Dakota Days football game. The Yotes came in 61-32-5, all-time on D-Days, though they were just 1-3 for three since joining the Valley. The visitors would strike first. Martin Ruiz caps a 16-play, 80-yard drive with a 1-yard touchdown, and Youngstown State grabs the early 7-0 lead. Crazy sequence on the ensuing Coyotes possession. Ryan Sager hit as he throws by Derek Rivers for what seemed to be a harmless incompletion. That is until Leroy Alexander picks up the ball and takes off down the sideline. He's finally forced out at about the USD 10-yard line. But what just happened? Have another look. Officials say fumble. Joe Glenn argues that it was a forward pass, but the Penguins keep the ball. That put the defense in a tough spot, but they were up for the challenge. Andrew Van Ginkle with the first of his two sacks on the day. Youngstown State has to settle for a 33-yard field goal. They led 10-0 after one. They'd add to that advantage early in the second, facing third and 12 at their own 49. Hunter Wells finds a wide-open Andrew Williams down the seam. He streaks 51 yards for the touchdown to put the Penguins up 17-zip. USD looking for a spark, and they get one from the defense later in the second. Ryan Hillier picks off Wells, first career INT for the senior, and it gives the Yotes the ball at the YSU 32. That would lead to a 36-yard field goal attempt from Miles Bergner, but he pushes it wide right, just his second miss in his last 15 attempts from inside 40 yards, so the Yotes are still down 17-0 at the half. It stayed that way into the fourth quarter, and after the defense got a stop, Paul Anderson looking to make a play on the punt return, but he breaks one of the cardinal rules, tries to field the kick inside the five, and this is why you don't do that. Penguins recover at the Coyotes' two-yard line, setting up Ruiz for his second touchdown of the day. Down 24-0, the USD offense finally makes something happen. Sager heaves it deep for Michael Frederick, the freshman goes 63 yards to the Youngstown State 15. Bergner would get the Yotes on the board with a 39-yard field goal, making it 24-3, but that's as close as they would get. Youngstown State adds one more score and goes on to beat the Coyotes by a count of 31-3. USD mustered just 262 yards of total offense and 10 first downs in the loss. Meanwhile, the defense played pretty well, particularly against the run. The Yotes kept Youngstown State to 144 yards on the ground, which was markedly better than the 313 they surrendered to the Penguins last year. So not all bad news, but definitely a disappointing start to the conference season. It's disappointing, but uh, it's not disappointing to the point where we're, we're going to start to question ourselves and what we do. Um, we know who we are. You know, we have an, we formed an identity as a team. You know, to be those tough-nosed kids who you know finish every play, finish every quarter, finish every game. Uh, so we're not going to shy away from that. We're not going to back down and uh, go into a tank and say that's not us anymore. This loss is not going to define us, and it's not going to define our season at all. Now the Coyotes had injury added to their insult as well on Saturday. We'll check in on the status of running back Trevor Baba when we sit down with head coach Joe Glenn next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. And welcome back to Kyle Corner down at the Dakota Dome, joined by head coach of the University of South Dakota Coyotes, Joe Glenn. And Joe, uh, after the 2-1 and one start, there were a lot of people uh, looking forward to this football game. No one more than you. I know that. Mm -hmm. uh, you said last week you saw it as a chance for this program to take another step forward and to do it in front of a D-Day's crowd. All that considered now, does the, does the end the result get a little more disappointing? Absolutely. Uh, just given yeah, that you were so you, excited? you got to know that. And uh, – it's really disheartening, um, but uh, I give I give them credit. That's that's a good football team. They came ready to play. They did a good job. Um, they locked us down in the passing game. Um, we weren't able to do much run the football, and um, 
But I do think our defense played a great game. I mean, they got, we just said, 17 points off turnovers. Mm -hmm. Very short field for them. And I thought they really did a good job uh, holding down um, the offense of Youngstown State. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Youngstown State's defense now. Coming in uh, statistically one of the best in the country, and they, and they didn't give you much, certainly on Saturday. Uh, just 10 first downs for the Coyotes. Um, I, don't, I, mean, I know you don't like that number. Nope. Uh, but what were they doing uh, to make life so difficult for you? Well, first of all, they're pretty darn athletic. Um, they got two great defensive ends uh, that can rush and did a great job in the run. Uh, their linebacking core was solid. They tackled well out of the secondary. Mm -hmm. um, and in the passing game, um, they locked us up so tight and uh, were on us, uh, we weren't able to get open. We just couldn't really get much going. Um, they had us off balance the whole game, couldn't find a rhythm, and um, that's the way it ended. Yeah, you did have one chance down the field on the very first drive of the game, and, and you can't help but wonder now how it might have been different had you hit it. And that's the, the, the one to Eric Schufer deep that, that was there, and, it, and he just couldn't hang on. Um, it, yeah, it just uh, it had kind of a different trajectory to it. Ryan put it right where he had to. Mm -hmm. But instead of one of these, it was kind of coming in mm -hmm. uh, right over your helmet sure. and uh, until you're – uh, a center fielder and they hit one over your head and you got to go catch it right that's the way it was uh willie mays can do it i don't know many other guys <laughs> yeah. much he thinks he should have had it there's no doubt all right well the running game had been so effective for you uh over the the last couple of games particularly against davis and drake um but that took a blow on saturday in the first quarter when trevor bama went down with an ankle injury he did come back a bit eventually though did leave the game altogether. what's going on with him what's his status going for well I, I i'm saying he sprained an ankle okay. um uh, and uh I think he'll be ready. I haven't been told any different. So, very honestly, we had put a couple of freshmen in the game late. I thought Nate Gunn and Michael Frederick, uh, two freshmen, true freshmen, mm -hmm. came in and ran the ball hard. And so he finished a little bit better than the game. But we needed to do it early when, when it counted. Let's talk a little bit more about that defense. We said we'd get back to them. Uh, people who look at the, at the box score or didn't see the game might see that 31 points that you gave up and, and think that they had a rough day. But that, that really was not the case. I thought they played uh, pretty well, especially when you consider how long they were out there uh, and how short the fields were that yep. they had to work with. So they had the one breakdown and pass coverage and the long touchdown pass. Other than that, though, you got you, you got to be pretty pleased overall defensively. I think it's maybe one of the better efforts we've had. And like you said, of that 31 points, 17 of them came as a direct result of turnovers. In mm -hmm. fact, we fumbled a punt on the one-yard line. That's that's on us. I thought Tyson Graham had a good day uh, tackling from the safety position. I think he led us with nine tackles, plus he had an interception. Andrew Van Ginkle had another good game yeah. from the edge. more sacks. Yeah, he had a couple more sacks, three tackles for loss. Um, we're doing some things that... Uh, that I, I think we can build on on defense, and we just got to get the offense rolling a little bit. Uh, finally, now that, that you've had a little time to, to digest everything that you've seen from Saturday and start to look ahead toward next week, uh, what can you build on as, as you, you get started on prepping for Western Illinois? Well, you, I think the defense will continue to build on the things that they're doing so well, and offensively, we got to maybe look in the mirror a little bit. We're not going to junk everything we, we believe in, mm -hmm. um, but we just got to maybe – subtract don't add is a an old rule i've used of thumb and uh find something this week that we can run uh effectively and get the ball off and uh get some receivers open and if we got to get motions we got to get into trips receivers bunch receivers uh things like that that they'll help us free up some wide outs uh so we can take a little little off the running game all right, well, thanks for your time again this week, Joe. Thanks, and uh, good luck to you this week. Uh, we're going to hear more from the head coach coming up uh, in just a bit. But when we come back, Andre Fields is going to help us put a wrap on Youngstown State with a look at Saturday's storylines. That's next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. Welcome back. Well, certainly not the way South Dakota wanted to start conference play. Joe Glett has given us his thoughts, and now we dig a little deeper into the performance against Youngstown State with help from Midco SN analyst Andre Fields. Andre, it's time for Saturday Storylines. The first and maybe the most concerning chapter in this story, the lack of offense. USD couldn't get anything going. The ground game, which had been so effective the previous two games, was held in check, and the punch was even less potent through the air. Ryan Sager completed just 9 of 25 passes, for 119 yards, they turned it over a couple of times. Penguins' defense is good, but they're not that good, are they? 
Well, statistically they are. I mean, their pass defense is tremendous. There was really nowhere for Ryan Sager to go with this football. And they were able to obviously stop the run. So it really kind of took every option away from USD. They had to try to force some things. So yes, yeah, statistically, they are that good. The question is, can they keep this up? Well, Bo Pelini, they made his money being a defensive coordinator. So I think they should, and we'll see. And one thing Joe did mention about that defense is press coverage. He says they mm -hmm. really disrupted the timing of the routes because the guys got jammed up at the line. It took them a while to get into things, and obviously that made life difficult on Ryan. Yeah, definitely, because like I said, nowhere to go with the football. I didn't see a lot of rub routes or some, you know, certain formations that maybe could try to force some openings for guys, but nonetheless, they couldn't get open. Ryan couldn't hit them, and it just looked like pass defense did not exist. Yeah, the Yotes picked up just 10 first downs. That made it tough to flip the field, which meant great field position all day for Youngstown State. It also meant more time on the field for the defense. And speaking of that group, uh, we were looking forward to seeing how it would hold up once we got mm -hmm. into Valley play. Well, I thought so far so good. Had the one breakdown in coverage and the long touchdown pass, but overall, I thought they played pretty well in the face of some difficult situations. Let's get beyond the 31 points. Look at what Jason Petrino's mm -hmm. group really gave up. One number that really stands out, the 144 yards rushing for the Penguins. Remember, this is a team that had run for at least 228 in the three previous meetings with the Cowboys, 313 alone last year. But this time, USD holds them to just 3.3 a carry. Yeah, and you know, they had an emphasis going into this game that they have to stop the run. And they didn't necessarily stop it, but they stopped it enough. 3.3 yards a carry is outstanding for your defense. I think they showed up over and over again all day on Saturday. Now, granted, they still gave up 31 points, but it's like you said, spending a lot of time on the field, being backed up in certain situations. Some of those situations they even made the best out of. Yeah, and in addition to slowing down the run, the Yotes continued to put pressure on the quarterback. They recorded two more sacks both by Andrew Van Ginkel, giving them eight for the year. That ties what they had all of last year. They also notched two more interceptions. That's seven on the season. That's one more than they had in all of 2014. So good to see the trends uh, they set during the non-conference season uh, continue. Well, both interceptions came in Youngstown State territory, and they provided the offense with some great field position, but they couldn't get anything out of them. Missed a the field goal on one ended up turning the other one over on downs. And if you're going to win games in the Missouri Valley Football Conference, you have to be opportunistic, have to take advantage of the short field when you get it. Yeah, absolutely, because you don't know how long or how many times you're going to get it. In the Missouri Valley Conference, if you don't make those plays when you have the opportune time to do it, you're not going to win football games. All right, well, and finally, uh, the Coyotes had stayed, for the most part, pretty healthy through the first three weeks of the season. Uh, we saw our first significant in-game injury on Saturday as Trevor Bama, uh, second in the Valley in rushing yards per game coming in, went down with an ankle injury in the first quarter. He did come back into the game briefly, but we didn't see him at all in the second half. Not much word yet on what that means for this week. Uh, but frustrating to say the least for Trevor, who was off to such a great step. Yeah, I think it was a little bit frustrating for the offense too because they couldn't have their identity. But really at that point, we don't know how much Trevor was going to be able to give us because uh, Youngstown was doing a great job of stopping the run, whether it was Trevor, whether it was Michael Fredericks. They really couldn't get anything going. So I think the coaching staff may have just wanted to keep him out to keep him fresh. Got to keep him healthy. Got to have him going forward uh, if you're going to have a pretty good run at this thing. All right, well, the Kyles will look to rebound this week uh, as they hit the road to take on Western Illinois. We're going to preview their matchup with the Leathernecks next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. The Coyotes are hoping to leave any lingering disappointment behind this weekend as they hit the road to take on Western Illinois. And for more on the matchup and the Leathernecks in particular, we bring in the voice of WIU football, Scott Kornberg. Scott, the Leathernecks off to a 2-2 two two start. They're 1-0 oh in the league. What's the pulse of the folks down there? How are they feeling about where things are at? Well, I think people are feeling pretty good about them considering the, the emotional win they had against Southern Illinois this past weekend. 37-36, last second field goal pretty much won the game, so... Uh, that's kind of like almost a barometer mark for this program because they've been taking steps forward each one in each one of Coach Nielsen's seasons, and they're trying to make a run for the playoffs. And looking at Western's schedule, it is brutal down the stretch. So you never want to say anything is a must-win game, but they, you almost look at that at least from from some of the maybe not the coaching staff, but other people around the program look at. That Southern Illinois game is a, is a must-win, and maybe even to an extent South Dakota because those are two on your home turf against teams that are, you know, around your talent level that you want to maybe steal one 
from some of the, the better teams in the Missouri Valley Football Conference later down the stretch. Yeah, if you're going to do that, you've got to be productive on offense. Western Illinois struggled with that the first couple of weeks, but it seems like things have changed since the return of running back Nico Watson. What does he bring that's so valuable? Oh, he's remarkable. He's not a speed guy. In in this conference, I feel like you see a lot of guys who are really fast in that running back position. He's like the complete opposite. I mean, he's a big dude. He's listed at 250 pounds, and in these two games since he's been back, he, you know, you can really see how tough he is to tackle. Uh, he's dragging three, four guys sometimes for a few extra yards. So he's just a really physical runner. I think that was something the offense lacked. And, and just having him in for the Coastal Carolina game and the Southern Illinois game, it's made a big impact not only in, in the success on the ground, but it's really opened things up in the passing game for this Western offense as well. All right, let's switch it over to the defense now. This is a younger group than the Leathernecks have had the past couple of seasons. And any time you add youth into the equation, you have to lower the expectations a bit, but it seems like they're getting things figured out. They're not shutting teams down, but they've definitely found ways to contribute. Oh, yeah, the defense has been really phenomenal so far, and I think that was a bit of a question mark. Not so much the defensive line because they had so much experience there and some really good players in that line, but the back seven uh, was a question simply because they they were all underclassmen. They're all talented kids, and I think that's what's been proven over these first four games is that the talent has won out. They really have an outstanding player in the middle of that linebacking core and Brett Taylor, as well as their two safeties, Aaron Diggs and David Griffiths. Uh, they are the leaders of this defense because those three in particular make all the calls among the back seven. They've been a really outstanding job even since their freshman year last year in adjusting to the college game. All right, that again, the voice of Western Illinois football, Scott Kornberg. South Dakota and Western Illinois will meet Saturday afternoon in Macomb. The Coyotes will be looking to snap a three-game skid against the Leathernecks, which includes a 24-10 loss they suffered at Hanson Field back in 2013. The fact is, the past couple times we've played these guys, we weren't very healthy. And, uh, and I give them a lot of credit. They got, they've thrown the ball well on us, and now if they can run the ball a little bit better... Uh, They'll, they'll, they'll be a, really a force to be reckoned with. And uh, defensively, they're young, but uh, they're playing really well. Uh, they've had a tough schedule, and uh, they've handled it real well. Uh, they had a big win at home over Southern Illinois. So they got some wind in their sail. And we got to go in there with the upset in mind and play our hearts out. Kickoff at Hanson Field slated for 3 p.m. Saturday. I will be on the trip, so be sure to check back for updates throughout the weekend. The voice of Coyote football, Joe Van Gore, will join me for another edition of Three Things with JVG on the Kyle Corner video blog on Friday. And go to MidcoSN.com for that. For thoughts during the game, you can also follow me on Twitter at Elson MidcoSN. Well, the fall isn't reserved for football at USD. We'll wrap things up with a look at how some of the school's other teams fared last weekend after this. Coyote Corner. On Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. Welcome back. Well, as you know, football takes up the majority of our time each week here on Kyle Corner, but it's certainly not the only sport at USD in action right now. And to get you up to speed on what's happening elsewhere around Coyote Athletics, here's Alex Heiner. Well, thanks, Jay. Well, a week after earning some national respect at the Roy Griak Invitational in the Twin Cities, the Kyle cross-country teams were back in action a little closer to home this past Saturday, with both the women and the men finding success in Brookings at the South Dakota State Classic. On the women's side, the senior trio of Amber Eichhorn, Katie Wettstein, and Kelsey Barrett each finished in the top five to lead South Dakota to the women's team title over a field from the Summit League and the Big Sky. Individually, Eichhorn and Wettstein earned champion and runner-up honors, with Barrett finishing fifth. Four other runners for the defending Summit League champion Coyotes would place in the top 25. The USD men would finish in fourth place out of four in the team standings behind SDSU, NDSU, and UND, though senior Isaac Allen would earn runner-up honors on the day. Sophomore Bryce Kalman would also finish in the top 20 for the Oats. Standout senior Mubarak Musa did not run in Brookings after placing ninth at the GRIAC a week ago. 
To the pitch now where the USD women's soccer team wrapped up a four-game homestand this past weekend with their first conference matches of the year. The Oats would fall 1-0 to the Oral Roberts Golden Eagles on Friday with the ORU game winner coming on a converted penalty kick in the 47th minute. South Dakota would bounce back in a big way though on Sunday, hammering Summit League preseason favorite Denver four goals to one. Corey Strang had two goals in the win to go along with strikes from Courtney Baker and Brenna Bills. USD is now 4-9 on the season, and head coach Mandy Green can see that things are starting to come together. I was proud of how we played. We have been pushing and pushing and pushing to get us to actually be more relaxed and have more fun and connect some passes and do all that kind of stuff because, I mean, that's what we've been working on a lot and it just hasn't been showing up very well in games. And I was proud to see that, that they showed up. Finally, it was a second consecutive hard luck weekend for USD Volleyball as the Yotes dropped a pair of four set road matches to North Dakota State and to Denver. South Dakota is now 6-11 on the season and 0-4 in conference, but the slow start is just a teaching tool, according to head coach Leanne Williamson. You have to take everyone seriously and you can't take can't take plays off, you can't take games off. And you know, we learned that already. And as long as we've learned that lesson and we can make sure that we're coming out as strong as we can, you know, every day, um, we'll be just fine. Finally, a little history was made by USD golfer Jordan Reichel last week. The senior won the SIUE Derek Dolank Invitational last Tuesday in Madison, Illinois, with a 54-hole program record score of 14 under par. The win came over a field of 87 other golfers and is the second victory of Reichel's Coyote career, Jay. All right, that is our time for this week. For Alex Heinert, I'm Jay Elson. Remember to bring it back here next Tuesday night for another episode of Coyote Corner.